Good morning, Charisma. Welcome to the church for all nations. Today is a special day. It's Baptism Sunday. Going all in for Jesus. Can we just cheer on those people who will be baptized in water later on? Why are we doing this? Because it's a command by God. God says, go and make disciples of all nations. And if you are a disciple, God says, baptize them. The word baptize is immerse. That's why we do immersion, not sprinkling or pouring. We do the biblical way. We dunk you with, into the water because the Bible says, baptize, immerse in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. And so today, we will celebrate today. If you have not followed the Lord yet in this manner, and you are a disciple, means a follower of Jesus. You want to do it publicly. It's just a public declaration of what's happening the inside of you. Today, we'll give you this T-shirt just for $9.95. <laughs> just kidding. We live to give and we? It's for free. We have a lot of T-shirts available here. So let me know if you want to after church service. Toward the end of a service, we're going to celebrate water baptism. Stand up on your feet as we read our scripture or our, our, our new series, Standing Up in a Bowed Down World. We are doing a book, the book of Daniel. I'm, I'm excited because the book of Daniel is telling us the end of the world. How will this world end? So that's why God doesn't want us to be surprised. God doesn't want us to be worrying about the end of the world. He gives us the B-I-B-L-E, the Bible. And the, the prophet Daniel saw it thousands of years ago, how this world will end. And that's what we're standing, study, studying about. So here's the story. Everybody read this together. King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Everybody say one world religion. Everybody say one world order. There was a time in this world that is reality. That's what they're hoping for to happen in the coming years. Probably you hear that. One world ruler, one world religion, and the king set up a 90 feet statue that everyone must bow down as an act of worship to this, new, this kingdom, the Babylonian kingdom. Then the herald proclaimed, as the Bible says, let's read it together, whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a place. So it's, a, it's worship. Bowing down to this image means worship. If you don't bow, you get burned, end up in the blazing furnace. Therefore, look what happened next. As soon as they heard the music, everybody reads together, all the nations... Peoples of every one world religion fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Except for a few Hebrew children who said, we're not going to bow down. Listen to what they said. Everybody read this together. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver. Can I ask you, Charisma, do you believe the God you serve is able? Yes. Do you really believe the God you serve is able to deliver us? Yes. Come on, let, tell the person next to you, God is able to deliver us. And then He will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if He does not, that's faith. If you kill me, I'll, I'll die for Jesus. We want you to know, your majesty, we will not bow down or worship to the image of God that you have set up. Everybody say, stand up, stand up. in a bow down world. Down. You can now be seated. And the question of Daniel probably is your question today. Is it possible to live with courage and convictions when my circumstances are completely removed from the dreams I had for my life? When you know, when this COVID-19 hit us, this pandemic that hit the world, some of us are saying, how could we live with our dreams, 
with our hopes high when our circumstances are completely removed. Cancel sports, cancel school. Some people lost their job. Some people even cancel relationship as if that everything has been taken away from us. Is it as if we're all living in a nightmare? Is it possible for us to have a dream? The book of Daniel answers that clearly because I want to share to you what happened to Daniel as if their dreams has been shattered. You know, I want to use this as illustration. How many of you are sports fan? Do I have any sports fan in the house? Do we have any some Seahawks fans in the house? Do we have some Seattle Mariners fans in the house? <laughs> Those are the few good men still believing. Now, I have in my hand a baseball. You know how much this baseball worth right now? Before I ask, $5,000. You know why it's $5,000? It's in my hand. No, just kidding. Year 2000, uh, we live in Mount Lake Terrace. We have some Bible school students, Daffy and Nina, one from Oregon, one from Montana, and they attended our church, and then we get to know them, said, they're looking for a house to, to stay, to, because they students at Northwest University, and I, with my wife and I, we thought, we have a basement in the house, why don't we just let them live in our basement for free? They're college students. So they stayed in our house, we, we, our kids love them, so one day, they're shopping at Safeway, and it's a happen, it's an anniversary of Safeway, and they have a raffle drawing, and they won this uh, baseball. During that time, it's the, the height of Seattle Mariners 2001. In this baseball, all of the names and the coaches of the infamous Seattle Mariners won 100-something games during that time signed here, Ichiro Suzuki. Dan Wilson, Lou Pinella, Edgar Martinez. So one, they gave it to me. Huh? Thank you. One time I went to Mill Creek uh, Sport uh, uh, Clubs out over here that the, they, they sell the parapinaria. And I said, somebody gave this to me. How much is this worth? Oh, if you want right now, I'll pay $5,000. Then I said, wait, 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 wait. I think I'll save this for my retirement. Right now, if I sell this, probably it's just $50. <laughs> but the point is, if you love baseball, have you heard about the curveball? How many of you was, know what's a curveball? And you know, the curveball is something that's been thrown at you that is not easily seen. The fastball is just straight ball. Curveball is like you were caught surprised. And sometimes a good professional batter could hit the fastball and hit it out of the park. But when it comes to curveball, it's either they, they swing earlier or they swing late. So that's the meaning of a curveball. I want to look at the screen and read this description. When life throws you a curveball. Everybody say, when life throws you a curveball. So what is a curveball? Let's explain it. It's a breaking pitch that has more movement than just about any other pitch. It throws slower than a fastball and it curves downward before reaching the home plate. We have a proverbial saying here in America, life throws me a curveball. What's a curveball? Something which is unexpected, surprising, or disruptive. How many of you, COVID-19 has been a big curveball all over the world right now? Amen, somebody. We were, not, we were not ready. 2020, I'm so ready. 2020, the year of vision. 2020 vision, clear. My future is, this is my year. And then, boom, February. It's been six months now of lockdown, of quarantine and crazy. It's, we've been shut down, canceled. Disruptive. Maybe some of you, young singles, a curveball is like we are dating a guy for a couple of years and you're expecting for the D Day 
the proposal. And one day, this boyfriend of yours took you out for lunch or dinner. It's not the proposal. It's a breakup. That's a curveball. You didn't see it coming. Maybe it happened to marriages. That one day, your spouse hand you the divorce paper and said, I'm out of this marriage. It's a curveball. You didn't see it happen. Or what happened to my wife? The other day in a Zoom meeting, um, company meeting at Primera, and the CEO was there and said, I just want to let you know, I'll be honest, truthful, by November, there will be a major layoffs at Primera. And you could see the chat room questioning, oh, what will happen to our job and things like that. It's a major curveball. Layoffs. Or maybe to some of you, our family, we have a major curveball that my father-in-law is undergoing cancer, that we didn't see it coming. Now he's starting his immunotherapy. But let me tell you this, Papa, cancer will not be the end of your story in Jesus' name. Amen, somebody. It is a curveball. All of us have been hit with a curveball. Or to some of my family, friends right here, my love, as I love, a curveball is one day the, their daughter is depressed and contemplating suicide. That now that I have to attend to this, to this daughter, of course, it's a major curveball happened to our family. What do you do when life hits you a curveball? There are only three constants. Everybody say three constants. When I say constant, means permanent, guarantee, certainty. We live in a curveball world, but there's three things that is certain. Number one, everybody say this with me. There will be always, there will always be things I cannot control. One, two, three. There will be always things I cannot control. Let's read the book of Daniel. I like this. In the year King Jehoiakim reign in Judah. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon declared war on Jerusalem and besieged the city. That's a curveball. One day the people in Israel were just happy doing their business. We're now in the promised land. We're now in the land of Judah. We have our temple. Then one day King Nebuchadnezzar declared war on Jerusalem. And they have no much against this empire. It's a major curveball and besieged the city. You know, one thing I like about the Bible, it's history. It's real people in real time live in real place with real problems. So here is the history. 605 BC, if you're a student of history, southern kingdom, that's Judah, fell, falls to Babylon. And from the map, I want you to see this. The Jewish people, out of nowhere, now homeless, they are being transferred to Babylon as prisoners of war. And here's an architecture that they unearthed, findings of the archaeological facts. Here is a picture of the Hebrew people marching with just like a backpack, and there is a guy behind them with a bat. They're marching toward Babylon. You know, nowadays, beauty of Google, if you're driving, any place you want to go, type it in your, where you're starting and then where you want to go. If you're in Israel right now, you want to go to Babylon, which is now in Iraq, it will only take you 13 hours and 19 minutes driving by car. But the problem is, it, I don't know if you can go back to Israel because that's Iraq. Because they're enemies, right? Now, I want to explain to you. Question, where your thinking cap? Who is the father of the faith of Israel? The father of many nations. Who is the father of the many nations? Are we children of Abraham by faith? Amen, somebody, right? Because he's the, the first one who believed in God, the father of faith. Where did Abraham come from? Where is Ur? Babylon. So purposely, the Babylonians, when they captured the Israelites, they marched exactly to the places where Abraham marched 
on the way to the promised land. But now it's backwards. Look at the map. Look at the map. Look at the next slide. You see that from Judah, they will march now to Babylon. And they could see where Abraham stopped. Where Abraham stopped. Abraham. Isn't that devastating and depressing? It's like this, like me. I once a drug addict, I was hanged, trying out with drugs and suicidal. Then Jesus set me free and I live free. And there's because there's no high like the most high God. And then I became delivered. And then I became a drug addict again. I went back to the same place where I was incarcerated by drugs. That is depressing. So these people are marching back, not to the promised land, to slavery. Look at this picture, the documentary that they said. Now their heads bow. Exiles march to Babylon, carrying instrument among their meager possessions. Imagine that. You lost your home. You lost everything. All you have is like a guitar or a harp and a shofar marching toward slavery. And you don't know what will happen in the nation. And so, here's the story. The Hebrew children arrive, Daniel and the young men, and now they're now in the presence of the king. Look at the verse. Daniel 1, 3, 5. Please read me out. Read, read this aloud. 1, 2, 3. The king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his court officials, bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the, everybody say royal family. These young people are the future kings of Israel. These are the best of the best. Daniel, Hananiah, these are the royal family. Their future, imagine you're growing up, you'll be the king. You'll be, you'll be ruler. And now you are in a slavery. You are prisoners of war. And nobility, young men without physical defect and handsome. You want an illustration? Everybody look at Bill. Come on, look at Bill right now. Look at Bill. Right there, right there, right there. Yeah. I, I, I cannot say young men. Men without physical defect and handsome. Showing aptitude, every kind of learning, well-informed, smart, quick to understand, and qualified to serve as to the king's palace. Why? To teach them what? The language and the literature of Bible. Here's what they do. When they capture a prisoner of war, they bring them to that foreign country and they brainwash them, rename them, tell, teach them the new culture so that they will erase their history, identity, and their destiny. Look at this verse, Charisma. I want you to read this together. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Nazariah were four of the young men chosen, all of them from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with Daniel was called Belteshazzar, Hananiah was called Shadrach, Mishael was called Meshach, and Azariah was called Abednego. So what the Babylonians are doing, forget about Israel, forget about God, forget about your history. You're now a new citizen of this new kingdom. But here's the point. In the Bible, names are important. Have you ever wondered what's your name and what's the meaning of your name? Have you ever asked your parents, why did you name me my name? I know in the Philippines when there was a Mount Pinatubo eruption. How many of you in the Philippines when the Mount Pinatubo erupted? And it's all ashes. And there's this one family, the mom is pregnant and it happened to be a girl. You know what they, they, they named their, the girl? Ashley. <laughs> <laughs> because he was born during the Mount Pinatuba explosion. It's full of ashes. So name in the Bible means character and reputation. That's why in the Bible, Abraham, father of many, now you're going to be father of many nations. Abraham. Saul, persecutor, I'll change your name from the apostle. You'll be called Paul. Simon, weekly. Wick, you'll be Peter the Rock. That's St. Peter. They changed the name because it tells about his future, destiny, and character. What's the meaning of Daniel? You know the meaning of Daniel means 
my judge is El. El is another word for God, Elohim, meaning God is my judge. They changed his name to Belteshazzar, Babylonian name. So what's the meaning of Belteshazzar? May Bel protect him. In a subtle way, they're saying, where is your God now? Your God has forgotten you. You have a new God. His name is Bel, the Babylonian gods. Everybody say, God is my judge. I want to ask you today, Charisma. People will judge you. People will hate you. People will, will talk something bad about you. But don't you ever forget, no matter what they call you, no matter what they name you, no matter what weapon they form against you, God is your judge. Come on, somebody. God is your defender. Amen. If you want to give a clap of praise to Jesus, God is your defender. And that is what Daniel is saying. I don't want to lose my name. My name is Daniel. God is my judge. I want to ask you, Charisma, and those of you watching online, our culture right now, the world we're living right now, is not a Christian culture. It's called cancel culture. They're trying to cancel history, to cancel, to cancel all our, even our belief, they want to cancel it. I want to ask you right now, pointed question, please don't get mad at me. I'm just a messenger of the, the word of God. How has culture named you? You know, the deadliest attack of the devil is when you were kids. How many of you, when you were kids, you were named lazy, stupid, slow, ugly, loser? Those names, we heard that when we were playing, and even now we're grown up, we bring it to our marriage, we bring it to our adulthood, because those names, not just etched here, even in our heart. And that's how the enemy moved. He will try to name you and call you by names or rename you. Or uh, let me just ask you another question. How was culture tame you? Don't stand up. Don't speak up. Just be silent. Just obey what we told you. Just be on the side. Church, it's about time for us Christians and the church, and I'm calling us. God is our judge. Let us not be silent. Let's stand up for what we believe. Come on, somebody. Because if we don't stand up for what we believe, you will fall down for any idol. If you don't stand up for what you believe, you will fall down for any idol. This is what the world is doing to us right now. Everybody read this together. Do not let the world around you squeeze you into its mold. But let God remold your minds within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is what? Good. Meets all the demands and move towards the goal of true maturity. The world wants to squeeze us in. Talk like us. Live like us. Do what we do. What we, and what do they call us? If we don't follow their behavior, you're stuck up. That's what they said. Oh, you're stuck up. Because they want you to follow their mold, church. We cannot control what happened, but we can always control our response to these things that's happening right now. So, but it's not just the prisoners of war. There are things that they cannot control. How many of you, even though you're the richest man alive, you're the Bill Gates, you're the Jeff Bezos, you think you're that, at the top of your game, there are also things you cannot control. Look what happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. It's like the Bill Gates and the Jeff Bezos of the days, the king in charge. Everybody read this together. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. His mind was troubled. He could not. Whoa. The most powerful man cannot control his dreams. He was troubled. Probably had a nightmare. To show you some of the structures of the contribution of this great King Nebuchadnezzar. They found the gates of Babylon still intact. 
They transported it to Berlin Museum in Germany. If you go there, it's still intact. That is the gates of King, Bab King Nebuchadnezzar, the gates of Babylon. Listen to the inscription of what he said there. I'll read it to you. I, Nebuchadnezzar, lay the foundations, the gates down the groundwater level, and had them built out of pure blue stone. Thus I magnificently adorn them with luxurious splendor of all mankind to behold in awe. Oh. See, this guy is really, oh my gosh, he's so selfie. He's, he's into himself. I, Nebuchadnezzar, I am the top of my game. I am the top of the world. And also, did you know, they unearthed a palace. One of the palaces of Nebuchadnezzar. They preserve it. If it's Now, this is modern time. You could still see it today, but the problem is in Iraq. <laughs> and they even found a coinage with this picture. You know, one time, the wife of King Nebuchadnezzar was bored, lonely, sad. What do you do, husband, when you're bored? Your wife is bored, lonely, and upset. What do you do? <laughs> when my wife is bored, lonely, and sad, I take her to the doctor. Dr. Nordstrom, Dr. Macy's. I take her to the mall. You know what Nebuchadnezzar did? Because his wife was upset. Oh, Amethyst, you're sad. Don't you worry. He built her the hanging gardens. Wow. <laughs> I would like to have a husband. Are you upset right now? I will build you the hanging gardens. It's the ancient wonder of the world. King Nebuchadnezzar built all of those things. But there's one thing. He is not in control. When he closed his eyes. And back in the day, they believed the gods, G-O-D-S, they believe in many, many gods, speaks in dreams. So, let's read this together. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His mind was troubled and he could not sleep. So what do you do? Has this ever happened to you? You have a dream and you wake up the next morning and it's so, it seems like it's so real. Come on, wave your hand. We'll help you out. We, and it's so real, right? It's wild. It's crazy. Has this ever happened to you? You had a dream. The next day, you, you, we woke up. You forgot your dream. Come on, wave your hand. Now, here's the problem. So he's bothered. He's upset. Imagine. So he called in his magicians, enchanters, sorcerers, and astrologers. And he demanded, look at the next slide. He demanded that they tell him what he had dreamed. Whoa, 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 whoa. What King Nebuchadnezzar is asking, I had a dream. So he called his magicians. Back in the day, the advisors are the magician, enchanters, sorcerers, astrologers. And he told them, can you tell me what my dream was? How, how would somebody know? Unless you could go in Inception. You remember the movie Inception? You could climb up to the mind of the person and... and Read the dream. As this, it doesn't work that way. It's like this. If you're sick, you go to the doctor and you tell the doctor, I'm sick, doctor, make me well. And the doctor will say, how, where, where does it turn? How do you feel? I don't know. You make me well. No, tell me. No, no, no. Tell me. Make me well. No, you don't. You have to tell the doctor where you, where, where's the pain. It's head or the tummy, right? Nebuchadnezzar is saying, I have a dream. I don't know what it means. Okay, tell me your dream. I don't know. Tell me your, my dream. Wow. That's so hard. He said, I have a dream that deeply troubles me, and I must know what it means. I want you to read how the astrologers responded. Everybody read this together. Then the astrologers answered the king in. Read this word. Aramaic. Come on, charisma. One, two, three. Aramaic. Long live the king. Tell us the dream. And they will tell you what. So they're battering up the king. Like, oh, look at you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Look like you lose weight. You feel so, look so good, man. Everybody say Aramaic. Now, important truth. Daniel was written in two languages. First, Hebrew, because Daniel is Israelite. 
So he wrote this to the fellow Israelite. When it comes to the second chapter, it's no longer Hebrew. Everybody say Aramaic. Because Aramaic is the universal language of the world. It's like English today. At least if you speak English, you could go all over the world. Back in the day, if you speak Aramaic, you could go all over the world. In Daniel chapter 2, hear me out. Daniel saw the future of the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar about how this world will end. That's why it's Aramaic. It's not just a message for the Hebrew. It's a message for the whole world. So that's very important. So here's now what the king said. Everybody read together. But the king replied, no, I have made up my mind. If you don't tell me both the dreams and its meaning, you will be what? Chopped to pieces. Your house will be torn down. However, if you do tell me the dream and its meaning, lead us together, you will be what? Greatly rewarded and highly honored. Now tell me the dreams and explain what it means. Wow, that's the incentive program of King Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> There will be a major cutbacks. We'll start cutting your head, <laughs> cutting your toes, cutting your arms. If you cannot tell me the dream. But if you could tell me the, my dream, you'll be promoted and you'll be highly honored. No one can tell the dream of a person unless you tell them the dream. So the, the astrologers answered. Let's read this together. There is no one on earth who can do what the king asked. Let me tell you this, Charisma. There's no one on earth, but there is a God in heaven. Come on. We have a God in heaven. Come on, somebody. The scientists probably having a hard time. The doctors having a hard time. But let me tell you, God knows what he's doing. And God is in charge. Come on, somebody. What the king asked is too difficult. One can reveal it to the king except the gods. So they believe in the gods, many, many gods, but they do not live among humans. I'll explain that to you later on. The king was so angry and furious, he ordered mass execution of all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree was issued, put to the wise men to death, and the men were sent to look for Daniel and his friends for what? To put them to death. Because the king was upset. My advisor could not tell me the, pro the solution. Even those uh, new, re new recruits from Israel, they're not even part of the royal court. Killed them too. There are things we cannot control. How many of you parents know by now? We cannot control the attitude of our children. How many of you young people know by now, you cannot control sometimes the grumpy attitude of your dad? <laughs> How many of you know by now, you cannot control your wife? Amen. Amen. But the wife can control the husband. But there will always be things you can control. Look at Daniel, how he responded. Can I just ask you this question? When there's an accident, where's a wildfire, what do they call those people? First what? First responder, the doctors, the nurses, first responder. Have you noticed the first responder when they come to an accident? Very calm. They don't panic. That's because they're responding. They're not reacting. If you're afraid of blood, you cannot be a nurse. Because when you see a nurse, ah, you might freak out. I don't want to touch it. It's bloody. You cannot be a responder. Responder is don't you react and you don't react, you respond. A lot of negativity going around the world. But church, be like Daniel. Be a responder. Look what happened to Daniel. When Ariok, that's the king, this is the executioner, the top dude.
Let's read together. When Ariok, the commander of the king's guard, had gone out to put to death the wise men of Babylon, Daniel spoke to him with what? Daniel spoke to the executioner with what? With wisdom and tact. How would you do that? If you're in the presence of the guy who's going to cut your head. Oh, man, look at that axe, man. You sharp it so good, man. Come on, yeah, cut my head. <laughs> he started a dialogue. Conversation. Piece of advice, charisma. You want to end an argument? Proverbs 15.1. A gentle answer deflects anger. But harsh words makes tempers flare. When somebody's yelling at you, you know how you stop that? You answer in a very low voice. And later on, that person will even say sorry to you for betting. Now, how to respond when life throws you a curveball? You know, I have an ADD. That's why I want to speak in acrostic so it's easier for me to memorize. I want to use the word curve. Everybody say curve. curve. Turn the person next to you. I like your curve. <laughs> so letter C. Letter C. Everybody say call on Jesus. Charisma, can I ask you this? When anything happened in our lives, good, bad, and the ugly, Will you do this? Will you do this? Your first response is to pray. Come on, somebody. Yeah. Our problem is, what do we do when we're in trouble? Call the, call the, call the, call the, call the uh, loan officer, call the mortgage broker, call the doctor, call the, oh, those are things are good. Call, call, call um, a bank and uh, ask for another loan. Ask for, and then when everything is worse, then we say, okay, I'll try everything I could. I could I sh maybe I should pray now. What if you pray first? It will not get worse. Come on, somebody. Come on, church. Listen to how, they, how Daniel responded. Look at this. When he heard that he was going to be executed, he urged them to what? Plead mercy from the executioner? From King Nebuchadnezzar? From the government? Plead mercy from who? How do you plead mercy from the God of heaven? You pray. So probably everybody say, call on Jesus. Whatever curveball thrown at you, call on Jesus. He knows what's thrown at you right now. Amen. And then when you pray, Charisma, can I help you out? Everybody say, unlock or unload. Unload all your worries and surrender to God. Our problem sometimes we're not prayer warriors. Sometimes I'm listening to the prayer people, they're prayer warriors. They're just telling God all their problems. Oh, God, I'm going to be laid up. Oh, God, I'm going to lay up. Oh, God, I'm going to lay up. Oh, my daughter's acting up crazy. Oh, God. They're just talking about the problem, the problem, the problem, the problem. Why don't you stop that? Why don't you talk to your problems about the bigness of your God? Come on, somebody. You talk to that sickness, your God is big. You talk to that problem, God has got me. God's got in control, amen? You unload. You know, I'm talking right now, my wife, the other night woke up a little bit uh, uh, nervous because of that company meeting that next month he'll, she'll be laid off. And I told her, Sharon, I want you to be laid off. She get mad at me. I've been working there for 20 years, James. It's hard to find a job. I want you to get laid off. Then let's go on a cruise. <laughs> At least for one week or two weeks. What about 2021? Oh, don't worry about 2021. <laughs> You're not just like me. I'm just telling to her, if God allows you to be laid off, Primera is not our God. Primera is not our shepherd. God is our God. Church, when she married me, I told her, Sharon, if you marry a pastor, I will guarantee you, money is not a problem. Money is nothing to me. Oh, she married me. One time she asked me for money. Didn't I tell you? Money is nothing. Don't ask me to do anything. You go to work. 
Money is nothing. But no, I'm, I'm trying to point out to her. I'm telling you, we've been serving Jesus for more than 25 years now. And I can tell you, God will make it sure there'll be food on the table. There'll be roof on our shelter. God is the best heavenly father. We just unload our worries. Amen, somebody. And after you unload it, don't take it back. Amen? It's in God's hands now. Now, practical step, letter R. Everybody say, reach out to others. For encouragement and? I like that. You know what Daniel did? Look at this. Look at, look at this. When he heard about the execution, everybody reads together. Then Daniel went home, told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, what had happened. What's that? Support group. A lot of people are depressed during this time because of social distancing. We cannot be with our family. We cannot be with our friends. That's why we are not created to be alone. Amen, somebody. Would you please tell the person next to you without touching them, tell them we're better together. Amen, somebody. We are called to gather. Amen, somebody. I don't know about you. Just being in this present, I hope you're encouraged already. Amen. Just seeing these people. Come on, somebody. Just seeing and worshiping God. Church, I can tell you this. How many people have emailed me? Some from other churches. Thank you for opening your church. Thank you for having an in-person gathering. I'm suicidal. The atmosphere of seeing people in worship gives me hope. Come on, church. Our, our, the wife of our councilman was here yesterday crying while we're worshiping. He said, thank you for opening the church. Come on, somebody. Church is not a building. It's the people of God, and we need each other. In times like this, don't go it alone. The more we need each other, amen. Daniel was in trouble. He didn't keep it to her, to himself. He told his friends. Let's have a prayer meeting. Two reactions. One is a negative, one is a positive. How did Daniel respond with the news of execution? Knelt down with hands open like this picture in surrender. God, gonna kill us but our hands are in your lives are in your hands if we die we die if you spare us praise the lord i'll serve you in babylon that's surrender the man in charge the king nebuchadnezzar his response were things he cannot control want to be in control what do you do when you cannot control you worry you get mad get sad because the illusion of control is being taken away from your hand. When God is asking you, you let go. And let God. Daniel is, oh, I'm going to control this matter. I'm going to call all the wise men. And that's, that has to be a solution to this problem. Daniel. God is in your hand. Open hands. And Lord, reach out. And then, I want to ask you, starting next Sunday, calling all my friends. How many of you, we love America? Come on, somebody. We love America. We love our city. We love Linwood. Let's go prayer and fasting for the next 21 days. Because the problem of our nation is beyond us but not beyond God. And I know God responds to humility. God is attracted to people who are humble, crying out for mercy. What did Daniel do? Fast and pray. Why don't we call our church? Now, don't be intimidated. Don't be scared about fasting. Church, I'm not saying that you follow me. I'm going to eat only vegetable and water and, and, and just a Daniel fast for the next 21 days. Why don't you fast for the next 21 days, for three weeks? Why do you, why you stop watching the news? Fast from the news. It will give you hope. Come on, somebody. Because when you watch the news, you get scared. 
Why don't you stop going to the social media for three, three weeks? Why don't you, instead of eating two meals or three meals during lunchtime, make it just one meal? <laughs> just make it one meal. At least you're, par- you're withdrawing something, right? Instead of having a, a midnight snack, uh, just, oh, no, 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 no midnight snack. I'm just asking you, let's, and see, there will be a breakthrough. Then you need to view, every side view. View that this curveball is an opportunity to grow wiser, stronger. How many of you, during this COVID time, you make this your time to grow and get in love more with Jesus? Amen. Amen, somebody. I'm going to grow better. And last but not least, E stands for expect. You expect the best. Do you believe the best is yet to come, Christians? Why? Everything is out of control. You cannot even control about this COVID situation. We don't know who's telling the truth or what's truth, what's fake or truth. Why do you say the best is yet to come? Because there will always be one who is in control, and that is Jesus Christ. Amen, somebody. Yes, I cannot control my kids. Yes, I cannot control the situation. Yes, it's beyond me. Yes, the layoff is coming. I cannot control that. But I know there is the one who will always be in control. And his name is Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Listen to what the Bible says. Daniel, everybody say, Daniel 1-2. Everybody say, the Lord allowed Nebuchadnezzar to capture. Nebuchadnezzar thought he captured Israel because he's great and mighty. No, the Lord allowed it. No one can touch the apple of God's eye if God did not permit that person or that country to touch that apple of God's eye. Everybody say, the Lord. Church. The Lord allowed cancer, but cancer is not the end of the story. The Lord allowed divorce, but divorce is not the end of the story. The Lord allowed layoff, but layoff is not the end of the story. The Lord allowed COVID-19, but COVID-19 will not be the end of our story. Amen, somebody. Jesus is writing our story. And how do we know that? Look at how the interpretation of the dream The night, the secret, no one could tell the dream. But Daniel prayed, surrender, God gave him the revelation. This is what he said. The night, the secret was revealed to Daniel in a vision. Everybody read this together. Daniel prays the God of heaven. He said, praise the name of God forever and ever for he has all wisdom and power. He controls the course of the world events. He removes kings and set up other kings. He reveals deep mysterious things and knows what lies hidden in the dark. Though he is surrounded by light. There is someone who is always being in control. And when everything is out of control, can I suggest to you? Let go of that control to someone who is in control. And that is God. So now here's the explanation. I want you to show this from the screen. This is it. The astrologers answered the Aramaic. Aramaic. I told you earlier, right? Why now Daniel switched from Hebrew language to Aramaic? Because this message is not for the Jews. It's for everyone. During that time, Aramaic is the universal language. Here's the dream. The dream, he saw a statue. The head is made of gold. The arms made of silver. The tummy, the brass, made of bronze. The legs made of iron. And the feet, mixture of iron and clay. That's weird, right? That's wild. And... 
And then while the statue is standing, a little rock was thrown up from the heaven. And look at the next picture. And it says here, a little rock made this statue tumble. And this little rock started growing and growing and growing and growing. And until the rock covers the entire universe. That is how the world will end. So here's the meaning of that. I want you to see from the screen, the head of gold, when Daniel revealed it to King Nebuchadnezzar, it's about the empire, the humanity, the history of the world. You are the head of gold. You're the Babylon. And then, but watch out, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your empire will not last forever. True enough. After King Nebuchadnezzar, here comes the silver chest. The Medo-Persian invaded. And then Medo-Persian became the empire of the world. And true enough, after Medo-Persian, as we all know, here comes the, 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 the Grecian Empire, the Alexander the Great. And they conquer the Medo-Persian. And Greece became the superpower when Jesus was here on earth, Greece was a superpower. That's why the New Testament was written in Greek. The entire world speak Greek. And then, don't, don't be too cocky, Alexander the Great, the Greek. No, no, no. There will come a time. Caesar will rule. The legs of iron roam. They rule with an iron fist. Remember when during the time of Rome, they said all roads lead to Rome. It's literal because all of the highways back in that day will all lead to Rome. That's how powerful they were. And then the feet of clay and iron, they call it the unidentified world coalition that we are waiting to happen in the future. What they're talking about now is one world government, one world currency, one world ruler. September 15th. There was a peace agreement between Israel and United Arab Emirates that happened right before our eyes here, 2020. And they're saying five more Arab nations now is, is agreeing to, to partner again or say peace with Israel. This is a preparation for the coming of the Antichrist. But don't get scared how it ends. A rock was thrown up, little rock, and it grew. How many of you, the kingdom of God started in your life like a mustard seed. It's just a little rock. Then you came to know Jesus, and it grow, and it grow, and it grow, and it grow. Now your life is all about Jesus. Come on, somebody. Now you want to tell the world about Jesus. Come on, somebody. Let me tell you this. In the end, Jesus' kingdom win. I think we need to clap up to Jesus about that. Let me give you the word. I'm not making this up. This is what God says, Daniel 2, 44. During the reigns of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed or conquered. Remember what Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Come on, somebody. It will cross all the kingdoms into nothingness, and it will stand forever. Then Daniel, through the scripture, gave the revelation. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of a mountain, not by human hands. It's a divine from God, a rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown that a king will come to place. So if you are writing this story, for me, I would like to write the story. Everybody say this to me. In the end, Jesus wins. Let me tell you the background back in the day. They believe in Norse mythology. How many of you watch Thor? Thor. Thor. You know how will it, the end of the world will happen in the world of Norse mythology? The gods will die. Thor will die. The gods will die and evil will win. That's how Norse, Norse, Norse mythology. You know how Greek mythology teaches us about the end of the world? The, the Greek mythology, the goddess and the, what they're saying, later on Zeus 
and all those gods, Apollo will leave the world because the world is so evil. What does the Bible say? Yes, we are so evil. We are depraved. But for God so loved the world, he gave his only son to ever who believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God could just step back and let the world go to hell, but God sent his only son so that he could set his kingdom here on earth to the people of God who believes. You know why I say the best is yet to come? We know how the story ends. Everybody reads together. Revelation 11, 15. Everybody read it aloud. One, two, three. Have become now the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. And He what? There will always be one who is in control. So when life gets out of control, let go. Don't try to... Let God drive. Let God lead. Because here's the message of Daniel. God is in control. I want to say this because of young people. If I will explain this to this, everybody say this to me. God's got this. Come on, say it with attitude. One, two, three. God's got. Come on, tell the person that God's got this. Now tell the person that God's got you. You know, yesterday I was emotional. You know, if you've been in a, in a church for 20-something years, you have longevity because you've been here. You see people, you baptize people when they're young and then married. And I still remember, because yesterday I saw this little, this girl leading worship. That's not Eva. That's not Shella. That's not Sharon. That's Hannah Beltran leading worship. Come on, somebody. <laughs> Together with Veronica Pisebre. And Ati Sophia, women of destiny. And then I have a memory, even though I'm forgetful, but I cannot forget miracles, monuments. Kuya Hope, Ati I will remember that day when we were inside that hospital. Hannah was only eight years old and she was dying of meningitis. Of course, Hope and Emily, this is my only daughter. We went inside that hospital, and there, whenever sometimes I go visit to a room, I could I could smell the spirit. Sometimes smell like a spirit of death. And in the authority of the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and we believe. Now she's leading worship. Everybody say, God's got this. There was this one lady invited by Sheila. During that time, uh, it's like the life of the, this person is totally down to nothing. She was telling story. I'm so poor and sometimes I don't have any money. I have a single mom. I will go inside my closet and I will cry and I will cry. Invited to a church gathering called like this. A journey with Jesus. Accepted the Lord and the Lord turned her life for the right side up. Last year, I had the honor of baptizing them in water. Cheryl, together with her mom, and yesterday, a single mom bought her first house. Come on, God's got this. Last year, Thanksgiving was so hard for our family. Pastor Richard, his son, came into this world not breathing for three minutes, no oxygen. Imagine your baby boy came into this world. You want to hear the cry. No voice took from them. And for one week, one week, no sound until this baby cried. Of course, the daughter is saying, we don't know the future, what will happen to this boy because of that air. That, but, but we pray, we pray. Now look at the picture of this boy smiling and never stop crying. Come on, somebody. Everybody say, God's got this. Church, we read the book. In the end, Jesus wins. So this COVID-19 is just a chapter of our story. In the end, we triumph in Jesus' name. Amen, somebody. I want you to stand up on your feet today.
I want you to sing this from your heart. I want you to sing this from those of you watching online. I don't know what battles you're facing right now, what troubles you're going through. But at the sound of my voice, my faith to yours, I want you to agree or type in right now. And type in right now, God's got this. It's beyond my control, but God's got this. He's in charge, He's in control. And instead of iron fist and closed fist, would you open your hands to God? Can you do this with me, Charisma? All of us, like this, all of this. All of us, do it with prophetic gesture, all of us. And then everybody say, just let go and let God, open it to God. And remain, wave those hands in the air. Just worship God. And envision right now, with your spiritual eyes, you're gonna see a victory. The weapons may be formed, but it won't prosper. When darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. Yes, my God will. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. In every war he wages, he will win. Cause I'm not backing down from any giants. I know how the story Come on. ends. Come on. Yes, I know how. church we're gonna cross over to the other side of this coronavirus oh the battle belong to the same church i'm gonna see i'm gonna see the victory i'm gonna see the victory
in our physical act we express what's in our heart with a closed hand of the illusion that we are in control we are in the driver's seat we let go of the steering wheel of our life and we let Jesus take charge because he is the only one who is in control whatever problems trials difficulties we're going through right now it hurt us it painful but God allowed it if God allowed something to happen there's a reason there's a purpose yes the weapon formed against you by the devils to steal kill and destroy but don't you worry that weapon will not prosper in the mighty name of Jesus in the mighty name of Jesus in the mighty name of Jesus that weapon will fall down in Jesus name because that is your heritage for being children of God it's not we're good no 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 because God is so good amen because God is so good so today I share to you from the Bible the prophecy of the end times of how the world will end and the end Jesus comes and the world all of them will bow down to the one true King his name is Jesus so if you were smart if I were you right now why don't you bow down now why did you confess Jesus is Lord now? Later on, you will confess it, it's, it's in defeat. But now, in the freedom of our heart, we say, everybody say, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is my King. And Jesus is in charge. I let go and let God. All my problems are yours thank you Lord you're going to take care of us in Jesus name can we give Jesus a clap of praise today <laughs>